Well, it is good to be home. And uh, Amy and I spent two weeks of the last three weeks uh, co-leading a, a cruise, a tour, through uh, the journeys of Paul, starting in Istanbul, uh, sailing through the Dardanelles into the Aegean Sea, up to Philippi, then down to um, uh, Athens and Corinth, and then to Patmos, and then to Ephesus, uh, which is a great uh, ancient capital of Asia Minor that I'm going to refer to a little later. Uh, wonderful time with 35 others, co-leading with Mark Laverton from First Press Berkeley, teaching through the letter to the Colossians and discovering, uh, again, rediscovering uh, Paul and the people that he interacted with and the culture in which he ministered. Often as we read scripture, we just read it uh, one-dimensionally, and we quickly apply it to our own lives and think that's really the purpose of scripture is to read it and then to apply it, sort of scratch and sniff or peel and stick, just sort of, I, I got it, I, I apply it to my life without really thinking and, and dwelling on the word and, and, and asking the question, what did it really mean for them? What did it really mean for Paul? What did it really mean for the apostle John as he's writing this passionate letter, of 1 John, to the early church, which we believe was in Ephesus? So I want to unpack uh, a little bit of that uh, uh, together this morning and uh, understand why it is that John does not want us to be deceived, why he didn't want the early church that he was writing to, his dear children, to be deceived, and, and, and how it is that we can easily become deceived around what we believe. So I'd like to take a few moments here, take your manuscript if you brought it, and uh, I'd like you to open it up, or the bulletin has the passage right in front of you, uh, 1 John 2 starting with verse 18 and, and uh, going to verse 27. As I read it, I'd like you to focus your um, attention on the contrasts, the contrasting phrases or words in this passage that really form a framework of this portion of the letter, of his message to the uh, church. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming... Even now, many antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Messiah. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it taught you, remain in him. What are some of the phrases, the words that are in contrast with each other? Just shout those out. Pardon? Denies and acknowledges. Okay. Belong and went out. Are there some, um, some uh, synonyms for belong in this passage? What are some other words that sound like belong? Remain. Okay. What else? Another pair of phrases. Yeah. Truth 
Yeah, uh, big about knowing what is true, the truth. It's, we're going to come to that. What else? Any other phrases? Real and counterfeit. Real and counterfeit. We're going to talk about that a bit here, too. Is that right? I before E, except after E? Before, is that e, F, E, I, T? E before, I before E, except after How many remember that? Okay. Anything else? Christ? By the way, just a little uh, Greek here. Uh, Christ is the, is the Greek word for Messiah. And the, um, the word for anointing is uh, charisma. Sounds like Christ. This is sort of a play on word with Christ, Antichrist, anointing in this passage. What else? Anything else? Any other words or phrases that jump out at you that aren't necessarily uh, contrasting? Any, any phrase in there that seems to be dominant? Anything else? Remain. Yeah, remain. Last hour. Last hour. Pardon? Astray. Astray. Yeah. Well, let's, let's start with, with last hour. This is an interesting phrase. And uh, in this passage, we can quickly go to uh, words and phrases uh, that have a lot to do with the end times when, um, uh, when the Antichrist might come, the last days. And that thinking in John's day and is our days sometimes keeps us from examining our present and only looking to the future which keeps us from examining what's real today. John is writing to the church in Ephesus, and I'd like to share with you a couple slides of this amazing city that was the capital of Asia Minor. The, the real landmark of Ephesus, if you've been there before, is the library, which was the second largest only to Alexandria in the ancient world with ancient scrolls. And uh, the detail uh, just reeks of this great, Roman Empire, the power of the empire. As you go through Ephesus, you, you see uh, two really handsome people standing there together, uh, Mike and Amy. And, um, but one of the huge landmarks there, uh, besides the library, is the amphitheater that held 25,000 people. It's where the riot broke out against Paul. And right across to the right there, you'll see uh, is the marketplace. So as you come in, which used to be the bay, you see the green up there. That's the Meander River Valley, which is now all silted in and it's farmland. But it used to be the bay that came right up to this, uh, to this boulevard, columned boulevard, that uh, you'd come to the customs house as you came into port, come to the customs house, and here is this amazing 25,000 seat amphitheater and just glistening with white marble. And the agora, or the marketplace, right down there where the trees are clumped together on the left side of the picture where Paul would have had his tent-making business, right there in the midst of everything. So when the riot breaks out in Acts around, uh, the, uh, around Paul and uh, the silversmiths, this is where they would have taken him, right here. And, uh, but the city is also filled with temples, both to gods and to the emperor. Uh, it's a, a majestic city with statues and, and reminders of, of the Roman Empire, the power of the Roman Empire. Uh, the, the, the temple to Artemis was one of the great seven wonders of the world. Uh, the, the temples to the emperors uh, like Trajan and, and Domitian that dominated, I think that's actually Starbucks right there, is what that is, the first century Starbucks um, logo. Uh, but uh, one of the, uh, the, the statues in the city that remind you of the power of the emperors, of philosophers, of, of the, the people of the city. Um, uh, there's Hermes or uh, Mercury uh, with the winged feet. And probably my favorite one, I, I think the next one is, is uh, Nike, the, the goddess of victory, holding the, the wreath that Paul refers to, the, the wreath that we, we strive for, that's an eternal wreath. And the best part of this is the swoosh of uh, the Nike swoosh that's right there. You see that? The flow of the garment, that's the Nike swoosh. The... So you get the sense in this city, this great city, that there's all kinds of powers at work. 
There's religious powers, uh, philosophical powers, the Roman Empire that, that dominated the city. And what, what came across to me as we traveled from place to place throughout the Aegean Sea was the fragility of the early church. That Paul and John, who both, by the way, intersected in Ephesus, Paul came there first and then John became the pastor of, of that church was in exile from Ephesus to Patmos, just off of the coast of Ephesus, and came back to Ephesus to die there. But um, the, the fragility, Paul and John both knew the fragility of the early church. Without a bound uh, New Testament that, that codified the, the good news, without established buildings, with no power in the empire with persecution on the rise, with philosophies like Gnostic heresy that began to infiltrate the church. John is passionate. And so we see these, these contrasts that seem to us so black and white. But John is making the point that this is the last hour, meaning this is a time of crisis. This is a time of crisis. It's not necessarily the end days. It isn't that Jesus is just returning, but this phrase, the last hour, is written out of love by John to those that he truly loves, warning them this is a time of crisis. And the first point of here that I would like you to fill in the blanks here is that we too live in a time of crisis where our belonging, believing, and behaving are important to the integrity of the good news. We live in a time of crisis as well where our belonging, believing, and behaving are important to the integrity of the good news. We're going to talk next week more about behaving. But John is passionate about speaking to the fragility of the early church. He knows that the church could no longer exist. It's possible in his day at the end of the first century that because of the powers from outside the church and from within the church, the church could no longer exist as they knew it then. So he speaks about a heresy we're going to talk about a little later. This passion comes out in his use of the word belong and remain. He talks about this church as belonging to each other. And those who left them and those who did they actually belong. And this word belonging tells us about the commitment of the early church. In this time of crisis, how important it is for them to belong to each other. To take the relationship seriously. So, Paul, so John here refers to them as dear children. Elsewhere, it's, it's uh, uh, brothers and sisters. This great affection he has for them. And he wants them to have this, not just affection like uh, superficial love, but this deep belonging to one another. And he talks about those who left them. And they left them over theological issues. Because of a heresy, they left the fellowship. Speaking to the word belonging and not why people leave a church. Okay, just get that clear. Speaking to the word belonging and not why. So I don't want anyone to think that I refer to anybody who leaves a church as the Antichrist. Okay, at all. Just simply the word belonging. It seems to me that in our culture today, uh, belonging to the body of Christ is a very superficial, can be a very superficial connection. As I talk with pastors around North County, we talk about sort of this rotating uh, portion of our churches that go from one church to another church to another church over the things that we may be disappointed over or preferences that didn't turn out the way we really wanted them to be. And part of John's passion, and I believe Paul's as well, is the belonging to the body of Christ where we stick it out together because the, the integrity of the gospel rides on our belonging and modeling to each other and to the world the kind of connection that we have in Christ that's more than a superficial affiliation, but that really hangs in there with each other, that would call each other brother and sister, that you'd think of each other as belonging to one another. John wants to clarify for his dear children the truth. So as they belong together, they believe what's true. 
and they experience what's true so that they are not deceived. And so that they know and experience the love of God among them expressed in Jesus. So what is it that he wants them to know is true? The first thing is that our anointing is real. Our anointing is real. It's true. It's authentic. It's not counterfeit. Now, there's two contexts for the word anointing. The first is the Old Testament Hebrew context, and that is that individuals in the Old Testament were anointed. So kings, priests, prophets were anointed. And that anointing was temporary. So the Holy Spirit would come on you. So when when David writes, and let let not thy Holy Spirit uh, leave me, don't remove your Holy Spirit, don't let it depart from me, because his anointing came as a king, not as an individual follower of God. Kings, priests, prophets would be anointed. John is reinforcing that their anointing is real, and it comes from the Holy One. The anointing they received when they first believed, maybe when they were baptized, but when they received that word, when they first received the good news, maybe in their baptism, in their conversion, they were anointed, and that anointing comes in two forms. It comes as an anointing of the Holy Spirit, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, uh, in John 14, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives in you and will be with you. The Holy Spirit who comes into the believer's life, the Holy Spirit that comes to uh, comfort and to teach and to guide, to remind us of the things of Jesus, that anointing that each one of us has as followers of Jesus Christ is real. Each of us, as followers of Christ, have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the living God lives in each one of us. The Spirit of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, dwells in the hearts of believers. Each one of us carries with us the Holy Spirit. That's meant to be a guide and a friend and a comforter and a convictor to us. The one who would remind us of everything that Jesus taught, which is the second part of this anointing. The anointing that we receive is the word of God itself. Paul encourages the Colossians to allow the word of God to dwell in you richly. John here says, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. This is the good news that they heard and received. It's the truth that's in them. And this balance of spirit and word is an important balance in the anointing we receive as followers of Jesus Christ. Because the spirit that we receive as anointing can become a very subjective anointing. We can be led by the spirit into all kinds of things that may or may not be God's will for us. May or may not be orthodox theology, may not or may or may not be orthodox behavior. And so we need to balance the anointing of the Spirit of God that's within us with the Word of God that we've received. And this is the accountability of the Spirit. That is, the Holy Spirit comes to reveal to us, to remind us what it is that Jesus taught us concerning himself. This is an important balance, but it's what we all have received as followers of Christ. This is meant to affirm the Christians that John is writing to because their experience uh, bears this out to be true and they've forgotten it. The anointing is real, not just because we believe it's real, but because we experience it to be real. Truth, uh, as a post-enlightenment people, truth to us becomes one-dimensional. Simply intellectual truth. Something's either true or it's false based on what we know to be true. But John would never have used the word truth without understanding that it's to be experienced, not just known. So this anointing that they know to be true, they know to be true because they've experienced it. And I think about the, the situation in the first century church where there are no Christian bookstores. There's no Christian radio. There are no seminars to go to. No conferences. There's no PGF conference coming up August 14th for 16th. Be sure to sign up by tomorrow. There are none of those helps for the follower of Christ. What do they have as a church? 
to, to guide them, to convict them, to encourage their hearts. What do they have? They have the anointing. That's all they know. And I wonder what would happen to us if we were to burn all of our books or just set them aside, turn off Christian radio, don't access anything on the internet, simply gather together in community and discern together what the Spirit was leading us to do, balanced by the Word of God that kept us accountable. What would that be like? First, we'd experience so much more confidence that we actually have been anointed by the Holy Spirit because there's prompting in our lives that we, we think we get, but we doubt or we don't depend upon. And we don't listen to the anointing in other people's lives unless we're intentionally together for the purpose of discerning together what God is calling us to do that's best. Part of the belonging is that they needed each other to discern where God was leading them. John wants to affirm them that this anointing that, they re that they've received is real. First, because of the context of the Old Testament, but also because of the context of the Gnostic heresy. The Gnostics were those who, who uh, uh, believed that there was this special anointing that led to higher knowledge. And they were leaving the church they're in Ephesus, which, and by church we mean a house gathering. They were leaving because of this special anointing they could get elsewhere that led them to higher knowledge. And John wants to affirm that what they have in them is all that they need. Their anointing is real. That's something for us to remember and how we experience God's love through that anointing. The basic truth, the core of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ is that by faith through Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and makes his home in our lives in order to guide us, to lead us, and calls us into community together so that we don't stray too far from this basic truth. And there are so many add-ons to the Christian life today. We make it so complicated. And all of these resources sometimes make it more complicated for us. Everything should draw us back to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and an indwelling Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us and directs us as a community. And this speaks of God's love because God chooses by love to be near us, to be with us, to come to us he gives us what we need out of love for us. So don't be deceived. The anointing that each of us has received through faith in Jesus is real. Trust it. Secondly, he wants to affirm that we believe Jesus is the Christ. Now this is where John uses the, 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 uh, the contrast of Jesus as the Messiah and the Antichrist. Literally, the Antichrist is anyone who is working against the Christ. In, G in John's day, the idea of the Antichrist uh, went from a lowercase Antichrist principle or movement to a personal capital A Antichrist, the beast, the one that everyone's looking for, this one figure. And, and over your lifetime and my lifetime, we've all uh, heard the hunches of who the Antichrist might be. 666, it was uh, Ronald Reagan because that's how many letters he had in his name. It wasn't actually Ronald Reagan. But th there's always been conjecture about who the Antichrist might be. And John speaks of that by saying, if you're looking for the big Antichrist, you're missing the small case Antichrist, which is anyone who denies that Jesus is the Messiah. Anyone who works at cross purposes with Jesus being the Messiah. Anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ, and he's speaking specifically to the Gnostics, some who had too high a view of Christ, that Jesus at his baptism received this anointing, that Jesus was uh, not uh, fully God, as we said in our creed, but that he only received an emanation from God. Let me just, without being too confusing here, we say, here's God, here's the true God the Gnostics believed, and because here's, here's man, matter... Man is evil, flesh is evil, God can't touch what's evil. So there's a 
a series of emanations that come out from God so that this emanation is the Christ emanation that lands on Jesus at his baptism and leaves before his crucifixion so that Jesus is not fully God and fully man. He's just, a, he's just been anointed as the Christ for a short period of time. Well, that really, that directly impacts how we view Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. If he's not fully God, then his death is not an atoning sacrifice for our sin. If he is not fully God who is raised from the dead, then the gates of heaven have not been blown open for us. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then we are still dead in our sins, Paul says. So the Gnostics had too high a view uh, that Jesus was just sort of a super spirit, an emanation from God. And there are others who just believe that Jesus was purely a man, just a human being. Now, this, both of these thoughts are still present in our debates around theology today, even within our own denomination. And I want to say this really clearly. There are issues in our denomination today that, um, uh, from our General Assembly, uh, are sending our denomination into another year of debate. But I want to be clear that much of the debate is theological. And what we believe about Jesus, that truly is the hill on which we will die, is what we believe about Jesus. And we'll talk more about that later. But there's a theological divide within our own denomination that is more difficult than even the issues of sexuality. Because if we can't decide together who Jesus is, then our mission together is thwarted. Our relationship with one another is thwarted. We become so divergent in our theological perspectives that we can't come together in true fellowship. That's the real challenge within our denomination today. Jesus says in John chapter 12, those who believe in me do not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When they look at me, they see the one who sent me. And then in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. This is an expression of God's love for us. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son of the world that whoever believes in him should not die, but have eternal life. This is an expression of God's love for us. That he sent his one and only son to lay down his life for us. John says later in this letter, this is love, not that we loved God, but he, that he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is, the, this is the love of God expressed in Jesus. To believe Jesus is the Christ. This is the core issue of our faith. This is the one we follow. This is the one we trust. Now, this is not a judgment on people outside of the church who don't believe this. This is a judgment on those who call themselves Christians but don't acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah. Third thing he wants us to know and not be deceived about is that we remain in him. We said this at the beginning that the word belong referred to the body of Christ, the church. But this passage is bookended by this idea of belonging to each other, remaining with each other, and then remaining in Christ. That he remains in us. That he chooses to abide with us, to make our hearts his home, to belong to us like family. This is the promise of the good news by faith. That when we confess our own sin, we acknowledge Jesus' death for us, we ask him to come and live in us, to become followers of him. The truth is that he comes to remain with us. He chooses to be with us. That's the promise of the good news. In uh, seventh grade, the first small group that I ever was a part of was one where we read together the little track, My Heart Christ Home. And this is based on the idea that when we ask Christ 
to come and be our Lord and Savior, that he actually comes in and makes his home in our hearts. And Bob Munger, when he was pastor at First Presbyterian Church at Berkeley on a Sunday evening service where he had, uh, in his own words, had prepared poorly for this message and just began to uh, share some thoughts about his own testimony around how he came to know Christ and asked Christ to come into his life, he used the image of a home, a house. And in this little track that uh, it describes how he comes through each room and remains with us. And the, the promise of Jesus remaining with us is a great promise of the Christian faith that we cannot lose. We cannot be deceived. We cannot think that there's something we can do that the Holy Spirit would leave us. Or that Christ would no longer uh, be our Lord and Savior. That he promises to remain, to stay, to dwell with us. It's by grace we've been saved, not by works, so that no one can boast. And no one can say, I've done something so that he's left me. There's a remaining that he promises to us. The question is not whether he remains with us, but whether we will remain with him. And Bob Munger paints this picture beautifully. He goes from the dining room into the living room of his heart. The living room, this room was intimate and comfortable. I liked it. It had a fireplace, overstuffed chairs, a sofa, and a quiet atmosphere. Jesus said, this is indeed a delightful room. Let us come here often. It is secluded and quiet, and we can fellowship together. Well, as a young Christian, I was thrilled. I couldn't think of anything I would rather do than have a few minutes with Christ in close companionship. He promised, I will be here early every morning. Meet me here, and we'll start the day together. So morning after morning, I would come downstairs to the living room. He would take a book of the Bible from the case. We would open it and read it together. He would unfold to me the wonder of God's saving truths. My heart sang as he shared the love and the grace he had toward me. These were wonderful times. However, little by little, under the pressure of many responsibilities, this time began to be shortened. Why? I'm not sure. I thought I was too busy to spend regular time with Christ. This was not intentionally, you understand. It just happened that way. Finally, not only was the time shortened, but I began to miss days now and then. Urgent matters would crowd out the quiet times of conversation with Jesus. I remember one morning rushing downstairs, eager to be on my way. I passed the living room and noticed that the door was open. Looking in, I saw a fire in the fireplace and Jesus was sitting there. Suddenly, in dismay, I thought to myself, he's my guest. I invited him into my heart. He has come as my savior and friend and yet I'm neglecting him. I stopped, turned, and hesitantly went in. With downcast glance, I said, Master, forgive me. Have you been here all these mornings? Yes, he said. I told you I would be here every morning to meet with you. Remember, I love you. I've redeemed you at a great cost. I value your friendship. Even if you cannot keep the quiet time for your own sake, do it for mine. The truth that Christ desires my companionship, that he wants, to be, that he wants me to be with him and waits for me, has done more to transform my quiet time with God than any other single fact. Don't let Christ wait alone in the living room of your heart. But every day, find time when you, with your Bible and in prayer, you may be together with him. There's a remaining that he promises for us. And there's a remaining that we intentionally strive for with him. Let me say again what I said at the beginning. We're in a time of crisis. It's hard to open the paper and not see the time of crisis that we're in plastered everywhere. The culture that we're in is in a time of tremendous change. The political issues, the economic issues, the religious divides, those are just the issues outside of us. But even within the church, we're busy people who find commitment to each other difficult. We're by nature consumeristic where we're looking for what is in it for me. We all do that, which makes fellowship and commitment so hard. And then there are personal issues that put us into a spin of crisis. So let me speak just personally for a second. Come back from 
I guess I've been speaking personally all along, huh? Okay. Um, came back from two weeks of vacation. Uh, my grandmother passed away three days after we got back. You know, coming out of jet lag, sort of in a, uh, my grandmother, who was 95 years old, uh, died uh, on a week and a half ago. And we're putting together her service right now. And, you know, that's sort of a natural transition, but it's change right now. Uh, Amy came back uh, still uh, in great pain. Uh, her arms that you've all been praying for, her arms are almost perfect. Somehow she's got, uh, she developed sciatica in the last two months and is in excruciating pain. And nothing seems to be working. That's, that's kind of normal, but it's change and it's crisis on a personal level. I'm extremely concerned about our denomination, concerned about our presbytery, concerned about us as a church and how we respond. Okay, those are kind of normal, but it's crisis, it's change. Not to mention all of the other areas of crisis in our world, our economy, our society. We are in a time of crisis where our belonging, our believing, and our behavior are important to the integrity of the good news. The good news is not only true because the Bible says it. The good news is true because we believe it and we live it. That becomes a, a, a witness with integrity for us as people and as a community of faith. Let me pray for us. God, our Father in heaven, how grateful we are this morning that you have revealed truth to us in your word. Today, you want to remind us that you've given us your very self in the Holy Spirit to be with us and to empower us and to connect us to each other in community, to guide us and to comfort us. Thank you through your word revealing to us that Jesus is the Messiah. It's true, not just because we read it as true, but because we've experienced it as true. We've experienced your redeeming love through the cross of Jesus. We've experienced his words as truth. We've experienced his life as truth in our own lives. Our lives have been changed because of the good news that Jesus was fully God and fully man and came for us and laid down his life for us. And thank you for the truth this morning that you have chosen to come and remain with us, that you will never leave us or forsake us, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, and that you call us to simply remain in you. So we commit ourselves to you this week by the power of your Holy Spirit Together, not just as individuals, but together as friends, as the body of Christ, we commit ourselves to remaining in you and focusing on you. God, we are all in experiencing some kind of crisis. We sense there's a crisis personally, culturally, internationally. And we feel helpless. So we pray that you would lead us. Help us experience your truth so that your good news has integrity to a world that's broken and longing to hear it and see it. Thank you for being our everything who has created us and saved us and empowered us, anointed us to be your people in this world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to give each other a blessing uh, this morning as we go and remind each other that uh, not just one of us is anointed. We're all anointed as followers of Jesus Christ, as a royal priesthood, 
of living stones that are all built up into a building that gives glory and honor to Jesus. I'd like you to simply say uh, to each other, uh, shake each other's hand and say, you are anointed. Let's go with the blessing of God the Father Almighty, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. May we remain in him. Amen? Amen. Amen.